Welcome to the lowdown on physics. This is screencast one for unit two, area of study one, motion. Today we will be looking at scalars and vectors. So before we dive right in, I want to stop and look at or, or consider the question, what is motion? It helps to understand what motion is or how we would define it before we try and explain what's happening. Now, with a bit of prompting, students will generally come up with movement being the the best way to answer that. And truth be known, that's probably half the answer. Now, yes, when it when it moves, but it's got to have a change in position relative to something. You know, have you ever sat in a car and seen the car or truck next to you moving and you're not sure whether it's you or the truck? And you just need to sort of look around and try and find something that's not moving to work out who it is. So we need a an object, another object, or some coordinate system, and we call this our frame of reference. Okay, so today we're looking at scalar quantities and vector quantities. Now, scalar quantities are things that can be described entirely by their magnitude or their size. So these are things like time. Time runs in seconds, and, and that's it. There's, there's nothing else to to help explain what it is. Mass, um, it's how much, how much of the object there is. Um, similarly, we've got distance, it's how far you've traveled, and we've also got speed. Now these are just entirely described by their, the size, the value that they carry. Now, in contrast to scalar quantities, we have vector quantities. Now, these have a magnitude and a direction. So, examples of these include velocity. Now, generally, speed, you'd say you're moving at 60 kilometers an hour. Velocity would be 60 kilometers an hour north or south, up, down, left, right. So, there's some form of direction associated with it. So, it actually takes up um, space in, in the three dimensions. Uh, displacement similar to distance, but uh, this this also has a direction. We'll look at that uh, more later in this screencast. Uh, acceleration and force are also examples. So because of the nature of them carrying direction, we tend to represent them diagrammatically. It makes it much easier to do our calculations. So when we do it, the length of the arrow that we draw for our vector is proportional to the magnitude. And then the direction is indicated by where we draw our arrowhead. So for example, three newtons of force to the left or, or west would be represented this way. If we had six newtons left, then it would be twice the arrow length, but in the same direction. Generally, we would label the arrow with the magnitude on it. Um, but they can be drawn to scale as well. Now, negative vectors. Now, the, the size of the vector would be identical. It's kind of like negative and positive numbers. But, you know, if we remember going on the number line, it's in the opposite direction when it's negative. The same is true for vectors. We've got, if that's vector of magnitude A, then minus A would be the same size, but it's in the opposite direction. So now that we've defined a couple of um, things about vectors, I want to put them into context of an example by looking at distance and displacement. Now, distance probably easiest to describe as the length of a path taken. Um, so however far you've moved, then that's the distance. It's a scalar quantity and the SI units are meters. Now, similarly, Displacement is also uh, a quantity that we measure in meters, but it's a vector quantity and it's a measure of the change in position of the object. So, for example, if I was to walk, say it was a kilometer to the shops, I walk a kilometer to the shops, there, say due north of where I am. So, when I get to the shop, my displacement is one kilometer north. The distance I've traveled is one kilometer. Now, when I walk back, when I'm halfway home, 
my distance would be 1.5 kilometers. My displacement would be 500 meters north. So it's kind of an as the crow flies position. And likewise, when I get home, my distance is two kilometers. That's how far I've traveled. My displacement's actually zero. Relative to my starting point, I haven't gone anywhere. Okay, so adding vectors, because what I've talked about just before in that example was, you know, a vector to the shop, a vector halfway home, and then a vector the other halfway home. How do we add vectors together? And quite simply, if we look at this diagram, uh, I'm going to contrast how scalar addition is different to vector addition. Say I'm gone from point A, and I'm going to point B. So my vector that I would travel would be this dotted arrow here. However, what happens if there's some big jolly wall or something in the way and we can't actually travel straight there? I have to go via point C and then over to point B. Now in this case, it looks pretty close to a right triangle, but no guarantee. Anyway, we'll get back to that in a moment. Now, let's label this as sides A, B, and C. So A here is my vector here, B is my vector here, and C is the vector that I'm going to or wanted to do as the crow flies. Now, my resultant vector, this terminology here, resultant, is a vector that gives one vector that does the same job as all of the others added together. So this little harpoon symbol indicates that it's a vector. So vector A plus vector B is equivalent to, the same, uh, to vector C. It would get me to the same location as point C. If I just did magnitudes, A and B doesn't equal C. I've got to walk further for A and then B than I would just walking C. But in terms of vectors, to get to that location, I can add them and they give me the same value. So to reiterate that with a, another example, resultant vector is a single vector that does the same job as all the others added together. Uh, we're going to add three vectors. The important thing is that we always add them head to tail. So first vector A, starting at the next head, I start my tail there and I add vector B. Then I'm going to add my third vector starting at the head of vector B. I add on C and I get to this location here. So my resultant vector is that single vector there that gets me from start to finish. Now, sometimes when we're working with quantities in physics, there's going to be uh, subtraction that's occurring. Now, we talked about negative vectors before. So if I turn this vector around, it's the same size, but it's now the negative. And then subtracting a negative vector, it's a double negative, it makes it a positive. So if I want to subtract a vector, all I do is simply turn the other round, the, the one that's being subtracted around by 180 degrees. And then I just add them together, so head to tail. So the subtraction of those would be the addition and give me sort of a small resultant vector pointing down and to the right slightly. In other cases, we're going to multiply it by some scalar quantity, so some factor, basically. What happens is, if we multiply it by a scalar, its direction is not changed, it just changes the magnitude. So, for example, if we've got vector A, vector three lots of A, same direction, but it should be three times as long, so it should finish up here somewhere, like so. Okay, now the key thing, if you can get your head around this, it will make life heaps easier in Unit 2, but particularly Unit 3, this is going to be a massive benefit to you. And this is what we call vector components. Now, working in two dimensions can be fairly hard. It's heaps easier if we can work in just a single dimension at a time. Then it's just adding and subtracting the numbers. So for example, if this is our vector, and we've got to add another vector that's on some random angle, it's much easier if we kind of do the reverse of what we have been doing and say, okay, well, instead of this one resultant, I'm going to split this up into a horizontal bit 
and a vertical bit. And then I'm only going to consider all the horizontal components. Then I'll consider just the vertical components. And I'll get a result in horizontal, a result in vertical, and then I can find my overall resultant vector. So let's say we had these four vectors that we've got to account for. Say they're four forces, four, four forces pushing on some object. So we've got one left, one up, one up to the right, one down to the right. Okay, so looking at the one down to the right, I can break that up as a horizontal component that, to the right there and a vertically down component there, giving me the same, getting me to the same point. Same deal I can do across and up for this one. Then all I need to do is look at just the horizontal components. So I can consider that arrow, that arrow and that arrow. And then I consider just the vertical ones and it becomes a very simple addition game. So if we look at the vertical components and the horizontal, so let's start vertically. So we had an arrow down and then there was the component that was up. So head to tail, head to tail gives me an overall vertical resultant of that arrow there. Same deal with my horizontal. I had to the left, then I had to the right, then I had another small one to the right, which gets me to about there, say one unit to the left. So what I've done is just assign some arbitrary values of roughly what I think they look like, and we can mathematically analyze what's going on. So let's look at the horizontal. Say that was eight units to the left, then we added four units right, and another three units right, then we've got minus one units, or one unit to the left, assuming that right is defined as my positive value, which is generally the case. If I now go vertically, say that first one was nine high, then I came back by five units, then back up three units, then I would have a resultant vector of seven units up. And I can use Pythagoras's theorem to then uh, determine the overall value of my resultant vector. Okay, so now let's look at our two resultant vectors. So we had one unit to the left, we had seven units right. So that gives us an overall resultant vector of R. So using Pythagoras' theorem, my resultant distance would be seven squared plus one squared. Take the square root, we'd get 7.07 .07 units, whatever those units were. We could also work out the angle using a bit of trig. I haven't done so, but that that's uh, certainly the option that we would go for to help define the actual direction. Now, just to contrast, if we drew it diagrammatically and to scale and measured all the correct angles in, I could add head to tail, head to tail, head to tail, head to tail, and then I get that identical resultant vector. Doing this requires me to do it all to scale, measure it with a ruler, measure it with a protractor, um, which you know opens it up to a fair bit more um, opportunity for errors to creep in. So mathematically is obviously the best option to go with or going to you know consistently prove the most accurate. Okay, so that's it on vectors. So good luck with that and I'll see you in class.